Well, here we are. My name is Morgan Clark. I have been a name to you for many weeks, many months, but now here I am in the flesh. I am your new rector, Elizabeth, my wife, Lucy, our daughter, and myself. We packed up our house in Montgomery, Alabama, and we moved to Thomasville this week. We have been looking forward to this day for months, the day when we finally get to meet all of you, the day when we finally get to be in this space, in this town. We are already incredibly thankful for this church, for your hospitality, your welcome, and your support for us. As many of you know, Elizabeth is pregnant with our second daughter, so this is a season of big transitions for us, and we are grateful for the care that Trinity has given us throughout this season of moving. I want to thank Sue Ford, Greg Lang, uh, the whole search committee for the hard work that you gave during the search process. I want to thank Sue Ford especially. Um, You have had many conversations with us. You've answered many questions as we have done this transition and this move. We are incredibly thankful for that. You took on a big task being senior warden this past year, and we are very thankful. Thank you to the vestry for your hard work. in this process of transition. I want to thank the staff for navigating this transition in this parish. Uh, I want to thank Bishop Neal. Um, We are very close to Bishop Neal and his family and have been so thankful for his work these past few months as interim rector. I want to thank Justin for your care and love for this parish also during this interim period. And thank you all for the love and support that you've given us already. Um, We are incredibly blessed to call this parish our home, and we've already felt that throughout this move. Today has been a long time coming, and we are very excited that today is finally here. First sermons are very funny things. Um, I stand here in front of you, having just preached my goodbye sermon at Christ Church in Montgomery last Sunday. In that sermon, I looked at the faces of people I have known for the last five and a half years, people who I know people whose houses I've sat in, people who I have had coffee with and meals with, people who I know. Well, Today I look at the faces of people that I do not yet know. I don't know you guys yet. Now I've met some of you in the, in the search process. I've talked with some of you. Some of you have known my wife throughout the years through connections in our diocese. But for most of you, you don't yet know me or Elizabeth or Lucy. You don't know who I am or if you can trust me, or if I will listen to you when you need me to listen to you. Um, As Bishop Jim said a couple weeks ago, you do not yet know my dysfunctions or what my gifts are. (laughs) And I don't yet know you. I don't know what will make you laugh or what resonates with you or what your stories are. And yet I stand here in this place, at this pulpit, as your rector, as your pastor, and I am called to preach the gospel to you. I am called to preach the gospel to you, the people of Trinity Anglican Church in Thomasville, Georgia. I am not called to preach the gospel to the people of Christ Church in Montgomery or any other church or any other community. I am called to preach the gospel to you. So in these upcoming months and these upcoming years, my job will be to learn who you are, to learn what makes you laugh and what resonates with you and what your stories are, to learn Thomasville what it is, what makes it wonderful and beloved, and what makes it challenging. I was born in a very small community in western New York State. I am a northerner. Um, just want to get that out front. I'm from a town of... Now, when people say that Thomasville is a small town, I'm from a town of 1,000 people in western New York State, so even tinier. It's a place called Cattaraugus. And I can tell you that growing up there, learning a place, learning a town, learning what makes this patch of land what it is, is just as important as the particular people that inhabit this land, the particular people that call it home. Because the place and the people are intertwined. They're combined together. And I can't wait to learn what makes Thomasville, Thomasville. And I can't wait to learn what makes you, you. So what do you say in a first sermon? What do you say to a church who I don't know yet and who doesn't know me yet? I think it's best to begin with a question. I think it's always best to begin with a question. What does your heart want? What does your heart want? In times of transition, in times of change, the question, what do I want? What do we want? What does my heart want? 
It's always present. What do you want me to be like as your pastor? What do I want y'all to be like as a congregation? What do we want the vision of this church to be? All those questions are swirling around in our minds, are swirling around in our minds right now. But that question, what do you want, is also swirling around because of the season that we find ourselves in, the season of the church year, Lent. Lent is a season spent looking at the cross, preparing our hearts to receive the word of the cross, the word that God saves his creation through Jesus dying and rising again. Lent is a time when we think about our sin and the need for repentance and our need for God in our lives. It's a season when we fast and we pray and we give. It's a season when we look at our lives and we think about change. We sometimes think of Lent as some kind of New Year's resolution that happens after your old New Year's resolutions have gone to pot, and um, we try to make our lives better. We, We think that Lent is the time to try to be better, to pick up a spiritual practice, to quit doing something bad. And we can end up deciding that this Lent is going to be better than last year's Lent. And we're actually going to stick to the scripture reading plan that we set out to do, this set of practices, this plan to not do such and such. But then, like our New Year's resolutions, we struggle to do it. And three weeks in, we get to the third Sunday in Lent, and we've already messed up. And that's when the new pastor, he shows up to give you some kind of spiritual boost that can help you shape up and get back to where you wanted to, what you wanted to do at the beginning of Lent. And that's not going to happen this morning. That's not what I'm going to do. This morning, I want us to sit with that question. What does your heart want? It's a question that our collect of the day focuses on. Our collect of the day It's one of my favorite prayers of the church year. It begins with those words, Heavenly Father, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Those are the words of Augustine of Hippo, one of the most significant theologians in the history of the church. Augustine was from North Africa, and he lived in the twilight of the Roman Empire, the 300s and 400s. We know a lot about his life through his spiritual autobiography, Confessions. And although he lived a long, long time ago, Augustine writes and speaks in a way that modern people can really resonate with. He talks about emotions and struggles in his interior life. His confessions are open and honest. And at the beginning of those confessions, in the first pages, Augustine utters that famous line about being restless. Our hearts are restless until they rest in you, God. Our hearts long for something until they find that something in the God who created our hearts. From there, the words of our collect ask God for three things. And I want to reflect on those three things this morning alongside our lessons from Scripture. Let's read the next sentence of the collect. It says this, Look with compassion upon the heartfelt desires of your servants and purify our disordered affections that we may behold your eternal glory in the face of Christ Jesus. So what are the three key words that we see in this sentence? What are they? Look, purify, and behold. Look, purify, and behold. Let's begin with look. The first thing we ask God to do is look to see something, not to correct, not to fix, not to judge, but to look, to see, to see our desires, to look with compassion at his servants, his people, and see them with eyes of compassion. When God looks at you, when he looks at me, he looks at us not as one standing far off, but as one who is mercifully close to us. He looks at us with the eyes of one who has suffered what we suffer. And what is he looking at? Look with compassion upon the heartfelt desires of your servants. Heartfelt desires. I I love that phrase. It's one of my favorite things about this collect, and it's so Augustine. It's so St. Augustine. Augustine believes strongly that we are driven fundamentally at our root being by desire. We we aren't driven primarily by what we cognitively think about, what we know. 
No, we're driven by what we love, by what we're chasing after in our gut, what we feel in our gut, by what we desire. And now we're back to that original question that we began with. What does your heart long for? What is your heartfelt desire? Our reading from Romans 7 gives us a glimpse inside the heart of someone who is painfully aware of their heartfelt desires. There are many perspectives on who is speaking in Romans 7 in this particular section that we have in our lessons. Some people think it's the Apostle Paul. Some people think it's the voice of someone that Paul is arguing with throughout this letter. Some people think it's someone else. Whoever it is, though, the person is experiencing a pendulum of desire. The person says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. It's a lot of the word do in this passage. And we can feel, even as I read it, the, the push and pull of these words. The person wants to do good. They want to live out God's commandments. They want to do the right thing, but they are powerless to carry it out, to actually do the good thing. But the desire is there. The longing is there. It's the follow-through that the person is struggling with. For Augustine, we are driven by desire. We're driven by what we love. But our hearts are notoriously fickle, and they tend to seek love in all of the wrong places. Desire is good. Longing is good. But the object of our desires is often terribly wrong. It's pointed in a completely wrong direction. So what are we supposed to do? Does God simply leave us in the place of that person in Romans 7 being pushed and pulled about by our desire? Let's look at the second word in our collect. Purify. Purify. Purify is a beautiful word, but it's also one of those words that can give us trouble. It's a word that carries the baggage of holier-than-thou people, proud people who act like their purity stands above the rest of everything else in God's good creation. It also sounds like striving, like people who are trying to be better, trying to perform for God, trying to earn something from God. But if we look at the collect, who is the one doing the purifying? It's not us, it's God. Purify our disordered affections. In this prayer, we're asking God to take those desires in our hearts, those heartfelt desires that we have, those desires that are pointed in the wrong direction, and order them. Bring them back into order. Purify them. Take them and untwist them and point them in the right direction. But what is the right direction? The right direction is toward the triune God, back to his heart, back to relationship with him. When our heart is pointed back to him, when our desire is for him, when that longing in our heart is relationship with him, then the rest of our lives begins to be set right, begins to be in order, begins to be purified. We get a glimpse of what that purified life looks like in our lesson from Exodus. Our Exodus reading is the Ten Commandments. We've been walking through the Decalogue throughout this season of Lent. Well, now we get it in the readings themselves. It's the Ten Commandments, the ten words that God gives to his people Israel for how they should live. They are ten commandments that call Israel to love God and to love their neighbors. We hear these ten commandments every Sunday during Lent. We heard them at the beginning of this service, and they are heavy. We, in Lent, we kind of begin with the heavy stuff at the beginning, and then we move into the joy. When I read these commandments, I'm reminded of how much I need God to purify my affections, my loves. But I'm also reminded of the grace that God has given us as we live in his kingdom. 
As Christians, we can say with the psalmist, as we sung this morning, that the law of God is perfect, reviving the soul. The law of the Lord revives the soul, not just because it is true or because it's good or because it's beautiful, but because God has sent his Holy Spirit into our hearts to revive our souls and to keep his law. God doesn't just tell us to do holy things. He does the holy thing within us. If we are open to him and open to his work, if we are open to him purifying us. So God sees our desires and he purifies our desires. What is the last word in our collect? Behold. So we have look, purify, and behold. Behold your eternal glory in the face of Christ Jesus. The whole point of the Christian life is to behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus, to see God's glory. God looks with compassion on our desires, and then, when it's all said and done, we look at him. God looks at us, and at the end, we look at him. Seeing the face of God is a terrifying prospect in many ways. The Israelites, they don't want to get near God at the end of our Exodus reading. They're afraid that they're going to die, so they send Moses to be the one who has to bear that weight. But God's promise to us for those of us who are in Christ, for those of us who are in relationship with Jesus, is that we will see God's glory and not shrink back. We will stand in the presence of the God who made us, who loves us, who has saved us, and we will stand there unafraid of him. And we will behold that glory, that glory of God in the face of Jesus. We will behold his glory in the face of our crucified Savior. That strikes me as such a strange image. We behold God's glory in the face of the crucified Son of God. We have these two, you know, we we think of glory being this wonderful, glorious thing, obviously, glory, but we see it in the face of the one who has suffered for us. We behold it in the face of the suffering servant, in the face of the one who has suffered and died for us. And moving through the cross, we see God's glory in the face of our risen Savior the face of the one whose resurrection life we will one day share. So what does your heart long for? What do you desire? It's the question I would like us to sit with as a parish throughout this season of Lent, but also in this season of transition as I come to be your rector. I'm going to be hanging out with you guys a lot over these next few months, over these next few years. I'm going to get to know you, I'm going to get to know your stories. I'm going to sit in your houses. We're going to go to coffee. We're going to eat meals. And we're going to return to this question time and time again. What do we want together as a parish? The first question that Jesus asks in John's gospel is, what do you want? John the Baptist's disciples, they they come up to him, and Jesus asks them, what do you want? What do you want this Lent? What are you longing for? What do you want this parish to be like? What do you want Trinity Anglican Church to be? As we continue to walk this Lenten road together, allow that question to rattle around in your mind. What are your heartfelt desires? How might God be purifying those desires this season? After Jesus asks John the Baptist's disciples what they want, They respond by asking Jesus where he's staying. Where is the place you're going to be, Jesus? And Jesus replies with the words, come and see. That is God's call to us this Lent. Not come and do, not come and clean yourself up, not come and be better. Come and see. Come and walk this road with Jesus. Come and see your longings met in him. Amen. Amen.